So we're just going to jump right in here, and our first presenter of the conference, the sixth annual James Hillman Symposium, is Gustavo Barcelos. He's a Jungian a analyst in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where he has had a private practice since 1985. He's translated several of Hillman's books into Portuguese and is responsible for introducing archetypal psychology to Brazilian students. He's the author of many books and articles in the field of archetypal psychology, imagination, and the arts. And all of these brief introductions uh, are elaborated in your program if you want to read them. So, Gustavo, please come and begin us. Okay, Go good afternoon, everybody. It's, I'm, I'm really happy to be here again. Thank you, Larry, Joanne, Gail, Robert, for inviting me again to be here. It's really, it's always a pleasure and, and really an honor to be here and speak to you again. So I'm the very first one. The, the essay uh, from the mythic figures from the book, James book, that touched me uh, most now is hermetic intoxication. So my, my thoughts and my, my paper was written, inspired by that chapter. Uh, because there he speaks, among many, many things, he speaks about very important issues, what I think are very important issues to, today for what we are experiencing in a global level. He speaks about globalism, communication, and the issues of borders, limits, and place. And I want to talk with, to you about walls, frontiers, and especially the consciousness of duality. So let me start with walls. Walls are not bridges. Walls disconnect and emphasize. Walls and bridges are the antithesis of each other. In other words, bridges are not about cutting things off, estrangement, farewells. They are crossings, more a type of link. Bridges cross borders. Bridges are connections, crossings, and are governed by different visions. In other words, bridges are exer exercises in perspective, exercise in viewpoints. With them, we learn particularly about the flow of views, that viewpoints are flows, and how these flows are healthy for an economy of emotions and of physical emotions. Borders are not walls. But borders can become walls. Walls are always a hallucination of borders, the border brought to its pathologized extreme. In other words, the wall is the suffering of the border, where it then is subjected to its own poison and it unlearns its vocation for union. Piece by piece, brick by brick, it enters farther into the nightmare of separation, of segregation, and of discord. When separation does not mean discrimination or distinctions, but rather a lack of unity and often a paranoid rejection of the other. Making distinctions is important and necessary. This creates the ego, and with the ego, the civilized world. The distinctions of ego create limits and consequently coagulate experiences, helping to form positions and ideologies and shaping projects and plans. Every form comes from limits. The ego itself takes its form by the establi establi establishment of limits from, separating from the separating function of limits. Limits generally show us where things end, teaching us something about finiteness. In this sense, they are a preparation for death. On the other hand, 
boundaries only demarcate what they separate by delving fully into the paradox of union. In other words, walls are modes of confrontation. They are separations, separatist dreams, dreams of unappreciated differences. And because of them, we are isolated. Separatism is the disease of separation, separation as disease. A psychology of separation is needed to profoundly understand walls and what they do inside us. The operation that raises walls within us glorifies separation. How can we understand this operation to be important and essential for the initial steps of the opus, known as the Nigredo, and calls it separatio? The art of dissolving metals to separate the pure from the impure, the spiritual from the bodily. Walls generally are passions. A wall always denounces a fixation, a way of looking at the world that has become rigid, a fixed idea that we like to secure within us. Behind a wall, there is always a fixed and sealed off world. The lack of plasticity in the walls, their vocation for the unambiguous and the finished, the fixed nature of their interpretations, the soundness of their truth, emphasize the dogmatic mentality. Every wall shows a propensity for dogma. Walls raise opposition, constructing differences that are no longer appreciated and no longer have value. <clears throat> Walls surround us with the dualistic philosophies of yes and no, a movement of cleavage and lateralities, this or that, and with the logic of exclusions. Walls are monotheistic, since they view only one exclusive truth at a time. Walls artificially elevate the value of things. Antithesis and hyperbole are their figures of speech. Now again, we live in a time of walls and of wall of, walled off dreams. We need to learn how to work more on the walls inside us because they affect our concept of border. To do so, we need to enter into the idea of the border to understand its psyche. Imagine them from the outside, only sees them as edges or ditches, trenches between opposing sides, defenses, resistance, fortifications, and they are logical unfolding into separatist movements, into paranoid ideological purisms, into narcissistic nationalist fury, into the fear of barbarian invasions, into immigration controls, hostile exclusions, xenophobia, urgent concerns with security and armaments, city walls, departments of defense, and espionage, which only literalize borders into walls. Walls, whether physical or not, are the result of not understanding boundaries as intermediaries, borders as connections. The function of connection is at the heart of borders. Seen from its intelligible interiority, a border is not separation, it is union. Borders are areas of convergence, margins and crossings. Exactly because of margins and crossings, I believe that a border is the consciousness of the between of the intermediate space, a mercurial space par excellence. 
borders mark the appearance, the appearance of, a, of an a hermetic consciousness. Hermes was worshipped at the borders, implying that the consciousness of borders is a hermetic consciousness. And borders spring up ev anywhere as soon as we enter that duplicity of mind that hears two modes at once. That's a James Human phrase. Duplicity of mind that hears two modes at once. What characterizes the consciousness of borders is then the duplicity of mind. Hermes witnesses this duplicity for us, but another figure, another mythical figure is more acutely connected to the consciousness of duplicity, a god who in the classic polytheistic imagination is connected to the primordial force that shaped the universe. A god with two heads that simultaneously look in opposite directions. Freud acquired a stone statue of this god to put in his office. Could this, could this be the god of psychoanalysis? A figure with both faces joined at the back of the head, one looking forward and the other looking back, one toward the past, the other to the future. Simultaneously considering two points of view without necessarily experiencing them as opposites or even as fusion or conjunction. This deity, with a complex personality, does not have an equivalent in other Indo-European mythologies and commands respect as a protector or a threat. I am speaking of Janus. Ja Janus, the Roman god who presides over beginnings and endings, the god of changes and transitions, of transpositions. The epiphany of Janus was materialized in doors and gates, celebrating the dialects of opening and closing. He is represented with a key, generally, generally in his left hand. It's curious that it's in the left hand. Can I go back? Yeah. The left hand. His existence affirms that everything can be a gateway, even if, it, if we cannot see the gate. Whenever we start or finish something, we have the possibility of a gateway, the possibility of entering or exiting, the possibility of a rupture of level, as the alchemists taught, the transit from one state to another. As a result, his archetypal dominance is over our experiences with entrances and exits, with passages and transitions, in other words, with borders. The border is a way of experiencing the world created within the Janusian cosmos. Certainly, Hermes is an ideal god of the borders, since he is a god of trade, of exchanges, of bargains and transactions. With him, we trade. With him, we negotiate. This is so important psychologically that Rafael Lopez Pedraza states no less than, quote, throughout history, trading has been one of the ways of natural survival. As the gods of roads, Hermes marks our psychological roads and boundaries, and thus, quote, he marks the borderlines of our psychological frontiers and marks the territory where the foreign, foreign, the alien, begins in our psyche. However, I would like to believe that the presence, the presence of Janus on the borders is more definitive, even more prof profound and defining, since it emphasizes their membranes, their porosity, their coming and going, transit, transactions, more strongly, more strongly than the fact that borders are limits. Hermes makes connections. But Janus is the passage, that which opens the door to the connection. In a different way than Hermes, Janus is also a god of trade, since he is a god of transport and of transpositions. 
like the energy that dominates the experience, the experience of travel and interchange, Janus is present at customs and immigration, at border control posts, at the docks in visas, passports, baggage, import and export, foreign trade, international relations, diplomats, ambassadors, exiles, refugees, expatriates, deportees. In everything that belongs to the cosmos of borders, they are regulations, they are dynamics, they are dynamo, where our lives can walk forward or backward or change places, either momentarily or permanently. The etymology of Janus simply seems to imply to be open, since he protects beginnings. Has the name Januarius for the month that starts the year in the Roman calendar, January, the month of the new door. He is the god of sunrises. Openings and closings, arrivals and depar departures are part of all the most critical experiences we have. Janus, therefore, is the initial movement in all things, the movement that opens or closes the doors, that allows us to move forward or backward. And, in and it is this which makes me understand him as the archetypal force present in, at borders. With this stated, we fully understand that it is at the borders, not at the center, that everything begins. Janus is a god of horizontality, because he does not look up or down. He looks to the east and the west, simultaneously traveling across the leveled field of past and future events, coming and going, in a symmetry of perspectives. This is his axis, one that is lateralizing and symmetrical. Meanwhile, north and south belong to another archetypal scheme, one that is more spiritualized, marking the vertical axis and its dreams of elevation and the abyss. In contrast, the horizontal axis of east and west would seem to affirm, like the God himself, the experiences of the world and so making in this world when we are more concerned with the surrounding links and outcomes. Janus presides over everything in which two linked possibilities exist. And in what situation is there not always at least two possibilities? Janus is there to show that everything that is dual is of man, since the divine condition establishes simultaneity, making the whole of a cosmos. Janus looks backward and forward at the same time, at the same time. Simultaneity is the lesson he brings. His world is not one of opposition. Janus is the same person looking at the past and the future, at the same time looking forward and backward, the same consciousness simultaneously in duality, a consciousness that is concurrently looking forward and backward at the same time, at the same is instant, origin and telos. We are always between the past and the future, and only a double Janusian awareness can indeed deliver us the present with its complexity. T.S. Eliot profoundly understood the psychology of duality, which was one of the subjects of uh, Bernd Norton, the first of his four Quartets. Now you excuse my English. 
Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. Time past and time future, what might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. Now, to end. The psychological question is then this. What person inside us is living on the border? What inner figure mimics Janus? What is the type of consciousness that Janus exemplifies? There is always something of the border inside us, borderline, the frontier areas that are experienced in duplicity and present themselves to us in a dual mode, the awareness that we are not always one, that we will never be only one, but that there is always a stranger in us, an other. Janus involves the deepest meaning of duality. And in these terms, he is an initiation. Now a quote from James Hillman. An awareness, this is from Senex and Poor, not from mythic figures. An awareness that individuality is not essentially unity, but a doubleness, even a duplicity. And our being is metaphorical, always on two levels at once. Okay, for me, consciousness of the borders is an initiation. It's always an initiation into metaphor. Thank you very much. <laughs>